Good morning. Oh, we still sleep? Good morning. There we go. All right, we're, we're all a little bit more awake and alert. I, I know why some of us are maybe moving a little slower. Um, how many of you enjoyed Fall Fest yesterday? How many of you worked Fall Fest yesterday? Yep, there are quite a few here for that. Let's see. Our you and I fans uh, are happy this morning. Our Iowa fans are happy this morning. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. Offense, offense. Need help with offense. And um, I'm sorry about ISU. On the other hand, they came back from what I was seeing. We were kind of keeping an eye on that during the fall festival, and uh, they tried to make a pullback, but uh, you know, things happen. So hopefully that will uh, pick up for next week. It's another beautiful day. It sounds like we're going to get a little summer this week. Uh, maybe a last taste before things cool back off a little bit. Uh, it certainly looks like harvest is coming along. Uh, I went out of t north out of town and suddenly things are disappearing from the ground. Uh, and it gets that feel to it. So certainly we keep all those who are participating in harvest in our prayers in this, oh shoot, what do we decide, Marlene, 18th Sunday after Pentecost? Long time after Pentecost. We're going to be pondering stumbling blocks and chopping blocks today in our readings. And whether you are exhausted from work yesterday at Fall Fest, exhilarated from that time together, Disappointed in losses, happy for wins. It is good that we are gathered together. I invite you to stand for our gathering hymn.
we begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. To you, O God, all hearts are open, all desires are known. From you, no secrets are hidden. We come to you confessing our sins. Forgive us in your love. Show us your ways. Teach us your paths and lead us in justice and truth for the sake of your goodness in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. With joy, I proclaim to you that Almighty God, rich in mercy, abundant in love, forgives you all your sins and grants you newness of life in Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. And we sing. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Oh, generous God, your Son gave his life that we might come to peace with you. Give us a share of your Spirit in all and in all we do. Empower us to bear the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite you to be seated. The first reading comes from the 11th chapter of Numbers. The rabble among them had a strong craving, and the Israelites also wept again and said, Oh, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for nothing. Oh, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onion, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, all at the entrances of their tents. Then the Lord became very angry, and Moses was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you treated your servants so badly? Why have I not found favor in your sight, that you lay the burden of all this people on me? Did I conceive all this people? Did I give birth to them that you should say to me, Carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a sucking child? to the land that you promised on oath to their ancestors. Where am I to get meat to give to all this people? For they come weeping to me and saying, Give us meat to eat. 
I am not able to carry all this people alone, for they are too heavy for me. If this is the way you're going to treat me, put me to death at once, if I've found favor in your sight, and do not let me see my misery. So the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me seventy of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tent of the meeting and have them take their place there with you. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered 70 elders of the people, placed them all around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. Two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad, the other Medad, and the spirit rested on them, and they were among those registered, but they had not gone to the tent, so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, one of his chosen men, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Our psalm is Psalm 19, and will be read responsibly by whole verse. The teaching of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound and innocent of a great offense. The second reading comes from the fifth chapter of James. Are many, any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. And pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death, and will cover a multitude of sins. Word of God, word of life. I would invite the children, as they are comfortable, to come forward for a moment. And I'll sit here, and you guys can sit right here. How's it going this morning, gentlemen? Pretty good? Excellent. So I have a question. Um, is there something in your life that kind of has to be done a particular way? And if it gets done a different way, it really kind of annoys you. For example, I had a friend of mine who had to have the crusts cut off of his sandwiches. And anyone who ate a sandwich without having their crusts cut off, oh, it just annoyed him to no end. Do you have anything like that? No? Well, let me tell you, when you get older, the way you fold towels is one of those things. 
I learned to fold towels one way. I have encountered folks who, um, if you fold them that way, it is the wrong way. And I'm sure probably most of us, if we stop and thought about it a little bit, we could think of something or we know somebody who, if it's not done this way, then it's wrong. Well, part of what we're going to hear in the gospel today is Jesus reminding us, you know, we really need to be respectful of others who do things different ways. That maybe that's the right way for them. And it's not that it's wrong, it's just that's the right way for them to do it. Kind of like the folding of towels. One way or the other, the towels are folded, which is a good thing, by the way. But if you fold it third, 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 or if you fold half, half, it really doesn't matter in the larger scheme of things. They're folded both ways, right? So if you come across those things, maybe if you find somebody else who's getting a little upset when things aren't being done exactly the right way, or if you have something where you're getting upset, just take a breath and remember that Jesus wants us to be kind to the folks who do things different ways. Can you handle that? I think you can. Let us pray. Oh, Lord God, we give you thanks for all the variety of ways things can be done. Help us be patient with others who maybe do things in different ways. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Thank you all for coming up this morning. I invite you to stand as we sing our greeting to the gospel. Holy Gospel according to Mark, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said to, said to them, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and to go to hell to the unquenchable flyer. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Now, salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves, and be at peace with one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Why is it so hard to change our minds? particularly when it comes to something that we closely associate with our identity, with who we are. Even when we're presented by trusted people with incontrovertible fact, 
It's just so hard. Well, okay, let me ask you this question. Raise your hand if you like being wrong. Right. Most of us dislike being wrong, even in little things. And that's at least part of the reason it's so hard to change our mind, especially when it comes to issues that feel like they have and may actually have some great cost for us if we change our mind. Unfortunately, the way our brains are wired tends to make us irrational when it comes to our core beliefs that we have about ourselves and the way that the world works. And that irrationality may see a simple change of facts as an attack on ourselves so that we react to that in the exact same way we would if somebody took a physical swing at us. It's just the way we're built. When it comes to life and death issues, the refusal to admit that we are wrong or change our minds can also be a self-defense mechanism, buffering us from accepting the reality that our wrong beliefs have actually hurt or killed others or maybe even ourselves. It takes awareness of these tendencies, a strong sense of self, and a supportive community of folks to actually make those kinds of mental changes in our lives. Now John boasts to Jesus, hey, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him from doing that because he was not following us. Now I think that last word, us, is the key to what's going on here in Jesus' response. See, John's concern is that these people were not following us. That they weren't hanging with the right crew. It'd be a bit like us trying to stop First Presbyterian because they weren't following us. Lutherans, who obviously have this whole gospel thing perfectly correct. Now, Jesus' response is to chide him a bit. Don't try and hinder them. If they do a deed of power in my name, they can't speak evil of me afterwards. Now, one thing to note is that both Jesus and John acknowledge that these folks are casting out demons and that they are doing it in the name of Jesus. So what they are doing is both effective and based on the power of Jesus, not themselves. And what Jesus points out is just because they don't follow you does not mean that they aren't following me. Just because they aren't following the same path as you doesn't mean God isn't active in them and what they do. Now our human nature can cause us to fall into this false belief that says, well, only the things done by us in the context of this congregation are blessed by God. Maybe we expand that out to our denomination. In other words, only we have a corner on the capital T truth. It feels kind of special when you think that, doesn't it? But if you think about it, what it actually does is place a limit on God and God's ability to act. You're saying God can only act in this way through people that we approve. Now, this past Wednesday, we read through the two creation stories in Genesis with the bridge participants. And I can tell you, there is no limits to this God who creates all that exists by just speaking it into being. I participated in the fall conference this past Monday and Tuesday with other rostered leaders from all the Iowa synods across the whole state. One of our speakers was a professor who has focused his work on the book of Acts. 
And one of the things he pointed out was that if you pay attention throughout the book of Acts, you found evidence that God was already at work in places long before the disciples got there. And so what he suggested is that part of our calling as Christians is to go out into the world looking for places that God is already at work and then naming that to not assume that we are in control of where God goes and what God does, but to be open to see where others are following Jesus, even if they don't recognize it themselves. This is what Jesus is pushing John and the other disciples to consider in his response, to be open to the fact that while they know God is working in and through them, and the ministry they are doing, it doesn't mean that God is not also working through other people in other places. Now having made his point, Jesus moves from his gentle chiding, don't try and get in their way, to something a bit more drastic. So what are we to make of this passage about chopping off body parts. Is Jesus really calling on us to mutilate ourselves? Well, of course not. Rather, I think this is one of those moments where Jesus is engaging in some hyperbole to get his audience's attention. If anything causes you to stumble, literally the language talks about something tripping you up and snaring you so you can't move. If anything keeps you from following Jesus on the way, no matter how important or vital it might seem to you, cut it off, Jesus says. Separate it from yourself. Because it's better to lose that thing that you feel is essential and enter into the fuller life that we can find in Jesus than it is to keep it and lose your life. Indeed, Jesus says in chapter 8, what can you give in return for your life? What is really more important than life? What are the things we fear, love, and trust more than God? Now, one of those things may actually be our own brain and logic. Our own mistaken beliefs that we have shown don't always line up with the facts of things. And when we avoid doing the hard work of admitting when we were wrong, when we have hurt others through our actions or belief, when we avoid doing those difficult things, we lose our life. And in this passage, Jesus says, it's better to go through that pain of cutting off a false identity, of letting go of a false belief and re-entering fellowship with Jesus. It's better to do that than to forego the pain and follow the other to the destruction of ourselves. Today, Jesus is continuing to point out that following him, being his disciples, is not an easy road. Remember a few weeks ago, Jesus says, hey, you want to follow me? Okay, pick up your cross the very instrument of your death, and follow after me. Or even last week, hey, you want to be the greatest? Then be servants of everyone else. Wait on them and their needs and let them go first. And so, you want to follow me, Jesus says this week? Okay. Be open to seeing God's work in other people who are doing things in other ways. Be open to the fact that you may be wrong. Be open to the idea that following me 
may be contrary to what you think is a core part of who you are. You want to follow me, Jesus says, identify those things that need to be left behind, cut off in your life so that you may follow and not do harm to others. Things that seem essential to us but really are not as important as the life of another. And it's not an easy thing to do. It requires a community that is committed to the same thing, that's open to change, to seeing anew where God in Christ is calling us. It means knowing that like the disciples, there will be days where we just don't get it, but we follow along after Jesus anyway. Now, with all of these challenges at the end of the day, here's the thing that gives me hope. We know that if we travel with Jesus, what we can give and what we can change will be enough. From Scripture, we know Jesus rebuked his disciples. He taught them. He cajoled them. He answered their questions. But the one thing Jesus never did was kick them out. Jesus got frustrated, fed up, especially in the Gospel of Mark. But what Jesus did not do is look at John in this moment and say, that's it, man, you're out of here. And that's what gives me hope. Jesus' patience with us. Jesus will hang with us in our imperfection even when that imperfection sends him to the cross. And he will show us that with God, we can go through the pain that comes with loss and be resurrected into something new. And what do we do in the meantime? Well, the author of James has a pretty good idea. We pray. We pray for our minds to be open to correction and new ideas. We pray for the wisdom to see where God is at work in the world and for courage to name that for others. We pray for forgiveness where we have tried to stop the work of God. Where we have placed more importance in those things that cause us to stumble than in the love of God in Jesus Christ. We pray for the help of the Holy Spirit to come upon us. We pray that it would help align us to live with God and what God is calling us to. We pray. And we trust that the love of God in Jesus Christ is more powerful than our sin, than anything that exists in this world. And that that love that love of God expressed for us in Jesus Christ will be enough for us. Thanks be to God. I invite us to stand as we sing our hymn of the day.
Let us confess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Made children and heirs of God's promise. We pray for the church, the world, and all those who are in need. We pray for the church and its ministry. Where we go astray, correct us. Where we are doing your will, encourage us. Where we have done wrong, forgive us. And in all things, give us your grace to know that we are enough. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for this beautiful creation you have given us to steward. We pray for those who are bringing in the harvest. Keep them safe. We pray for those facing challenges from natural disasters, the Gulf Coast from hurricanes, the West from fires, the East flooding. Give us wisdom to find ways to live in harmony with nature. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those in authority. Give them wise minds and compassionate hearts that they would strive for justice and peace for all people. Stir your spirit in people of integrity and wisdom to run for office. Grant wisdom to citizens of nations as they choose their leaders. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who are struggling with cancer, dementia, or any other disease. Provide them with peace and resilience for the days ahead. Sustain caregivers with energy and patience. We ask your blessing on all those who are diseased in mind, body, or spirit. Especially, we pray this day for Amy, April, David, Del, Sally, John, Anne, June, Abby, Deb, Stephanie, Lee, Cindy, Mark, David, Marius, Benny, Florence, Michael, Pearl, Dan, Hunter, Tammy, Les, Judd, Kathy, Jean, Butch, Rachel, Morris, Marv, Lenora, Lillian, and all those whom we name now aloud are in the silence of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the members of this assembly. Stir us to grow in faith towards you, love to one another, generosity to all, and remind us every day that through your grace and the gift of your Holy Spirit, we are enough. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Let us share that peace with one another as we are comfortable. Peace is always uh, an option. And then I will invite you to be seated. Um, it is that time of year again uh, to be considering our stewardship campaign for 20. 21. First, uh, we wish to say thank you for the ways in which you have supported and continue to support the mission and ministry of St. John. We'll talk a little bit about what happened yesterday in terms of that and in gifts of time and energy. But for this year, part of what we are focusing on is a theme you have heard today, that God's grace is sufficient for us, that whatever we do, will be enough. We've talked about that this year. And you'll hear some more as we move along over the next few weeks, but here are kind of the highlights. First, that despite what the world brings, God always gives us enough. 
and more than enough to live and thrive in our lives. We've kind of decided together that whatever we do in this season as a community and as individuals is enough. And because we know that God will always provide enough for us, the question we are asking in this campaign is, how are we called to be generous so that others can have enough as well? And also we are asking an additional question. How do we share the gifts God has first given us, our talents, our skills, and our abilities to help other people and other places, including St. John, have enough to do the ministry that they are called to do? Your generosity and your stewardship for this year enabled us to do things like provide VBS free of charge for 53 children in our church and community. We've collected food items from throughout the city of Ely, distributed them to five community food banks, including the one here in Ely. They provided for children who are attending college community schools. We've provided toiletries for Olivet Mission. And all of this is possible only because you are answering God's call to help be the means by which other people have enough. So we invite you to keep an eye out for the, in the e-news. We'll touch on these things over the next few weeks. A mailing will come out after next weekend. But in the meantime, thank you for your generosity through this year. It makes the mission and ministry of St. John possible. I most certainly could not have done all that happened yesterday by myself. None of this, including Sunday mornings, can happen just by me. It comes because of the gifts that you share with us. And we look forward, as we ponder what next year will look like in terms of our offerings of ourselves, what new things might be available, what new ways we might be able to help our neighbors have enough. And so, let us... Ponder that message a moment while I prepare the table. You got something for us to listen to in the meantime, Debbie? Yeah. Okay. Let us pray. God of abundance, you cause streams to break forth in the desert, manna to rain from the heavens, accept the gifts you have first given us. Unite them with the offering of our lives to nourish the world you love so dearly through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
God, our bread of life, our table, and our food. You created a world in which all might be satisfied by your abundance. You dined with Abraham and Sarah, promising them life, and fed your people Israel with manna from heaven. You sent your son to eat with sinners and to become food for the world. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his life given for us and his rising from the grave, we await his coming again to share with us the everlasting feast. By your spirit, nurture and sustain us with this meal. Strengthen us to serve all in hunger and want, and by this bread and cup, make of us the body of your Son. Through him, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom. Teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come to this table, all who hunger and thirst. I invite you to be seated. I'll invite you forward, starting from the back. You can come up as family units. Um, and as you approach the little table, you can take your mask off. I'll have bread for you on the plate there. There are cups uh, in the top one. The lighter color is uh, grape juice. That's in the outer ring in the top one. The darker color is wine. You can receive, and then if you would, place your empties in the basket to the right of the table. The meal is ready. Come.
Let us pray. We give you thanks, gracious God, that you feed us with food beyond compare, the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Fed by this meal, lead us from this place nourished and forgiven into your beloved vineyard to wipe away the tears of all who hunger and thirst, guided by the example of that same Jesus Christ and led by the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Thank you.